Hey guys, it's Matt here from pilotpracticeexams.com. So I've got a bunch of people enrolling who are um, starting their CPL integrated programs and things and getting quite a few questions about, um, you know, the progress and, and the timeline and how to map out and how to get employed at the end of it and all that sort of thing. And I thought I might throw together a quick video. Now I used to um, be a teacher, as many of you know, and Part of my passion in teaching was um, obviously the PE side of things, and I had quite a few good athletes, including two players that went on to play NRL, Albert Kelly and Aidan Tolman. And this is a, st a strategy that I went through them with in year nine, and basically what I did, and I want to do it for you. Um, for some people, you know, this is basic level stuff for them. Other stuff, they've never seen this before, and, and this might really help them. So what I basically did the other week, um, Qantas put out a employment ad and they stated in it what they're after and this was for their intake for the for the dash eight so this is um what i've done is just mapped out all their in all their requirements here just in a, a spreadsheet and then what i've done is i've uh tapped those into i guess a basic level gantt chart or flow chart um uh, with a bit of a timeline to try and give you a guide of what you need to be achieving each week each month if we work backwards from the point over here where you, you know, perhaps pass the intake, and I haven't put the application process, I haven't put everything on here, what I've done is, is put the big ticket items, okay? So let's just have a quick look and see how it works, because I think this will really help some people uh, map out, you know, how many flying hours they need to be doing each week, each month, etc. Now, I'm not going to go through the whole thing. Some of it's a bit self-explanatory, but I'm going to race through the, ba the bases. So the first thing is, before you start anything, you want to have your Class 1 medical. Because you don't want to get over here and find that you don't pass your Class 1 medical and you've wasted all this time and money. So you need to do that back at the start. And over here, Qantas are probably going to want a fresh one. And your Class 1 medical is going to be roughly expired anyway around that point in time. So um, you want to try and time those as best you can. The second thing is the RAARPL, depending on which way you start, is going to take around about three months to get to the level where you can start your PPL. Now, what does that look like? Well, for to get to, say, 35 flight hours, some people will be a bit more, some will be a bit less. Um, it's going to be three hours a week if you do it over three months, 4.5 hours flying per week if you do it over two months, and 10 hours flying per week to do it in one month. Okay? So depending on how keen you are and how much of a hurry you're in and what you can afford and in terms of time and cost, you can use these different numbers here to map out and those that represents uh, six months and that represents five months and four months. So I've, I've sort of just color coded the boxes to give you a bit of a, a, a timeline. You know, here, for example, the CPL exams, if you do one exam per month, that's how long it stretches out, you know, to your... Uh, so there's seven exams, seven months, and then you spend a month spending, sending out resumes, etc. So let's just continue through this flow up here. And sorry about the banging in the background. Some genius uh, in our apartment building has decided uh, Boxing Day was a great day to do some renovations. So, um, righto. So the, you need to pass your Level 6 English as well. You do that around about there. You need to get your ASIC card. Your PPL is going to take about one to three months. Again, here's the breakdown of the flying hours. Now, you only need 20-odd hours in addition to your RPL. So um, you're looking at about, if you do it over three months, 1.7 flying hours per week, down to one month, which is about five hours per week. And you can do it in, even in less than that if you're in a hurry. Okay, and then you're going to start your CPL. Now, there's two components to the CPL. One is the exams, the other is the, the flight progress, or your flying hours and your flight test. And I've broken down the hours here. This is for the flying, because the flying, um, the non-integrated is required to do 200 hours. The integrated is only required to do 150 hours. So there's the hour breakdowns. Obviously, if you want to do it in a hurry, um, the non-integrated, you're going to need to do about 12.5 hours per week. Now, some of you are going to go, oh, wow, that's easy. You know, there's 40 working hours in the week. But don't forget, you have to plan these flights. You have to have aircraft available, and you have to have um, instructors available often for some of it. And you've also got to have weather that permits you. So, you know, don't go trying to plan that you're going to be able to fly 30 hours a week or 35 hours a week, because you're just not. You won't find aircraft available, and you won't find weather that will allow you to do that in most of the built-up areas of Australia. Now, here's your exam progress. 
Again, look, if you do one exam per month, it's going to take you seven months. There's seven exams. Um, if you do one per month, sorry, and that's going to take longer too if you allow uh, longer for your big ones, your aerodynamics and your uh, performance. But also don't forget law is very difficult as well and has an 80% pass mark. So let's say you can stack them into two per month, um, but you allow, say, a full month for performance. Then you, your CPL exams, are gonna, you're going to basically study them for about four months. And then the fifth month, you're going to be sending out resumes. Now, an important point up here is I've written network, 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 network. Keep networking. Part of building up your employment is being able to network so that when you want a job, when you need a reference, all those sorts of things, you have the people in place that will, will recommend you. Okay. Um, another important thing up here, clean up your social media. Okay. Most of these big employers, for example, Qantas, Jetstar, Virgin, okay, Cafe Pacific, all those ones, they're all going to require you to be a clean skin. Okay. If you're the type of person that's got all these political rants and things like that on Facebook, um, well, sorry, mate, but when they go digging through your Facebook, you know, you're not going to come out with a clean skin and they're not going to want you on because they they make it very clear back here in their advertising one of the things they state is that they're an EEL employer okay and they've probably got a bunch of other policies as well so you need to make sure that you conform to that and do it for a long time now um, I suggest you send out your resumes well before the end of your uh, CPL training start developing it back here somewhere whenever time permits with your exams and then start sending them before you finish your flight hours. Okay, because often people will sit on them for a week or two or three or four, maybe even eight weeks. And then all of a sudden they get a bit of movement in their company and they need someone and they go digging back through that pile. So, you know, you don't want to be sending them out the week that you're looking for employment. You want them to be out there on the desks well and truly before that. Then you finish your CPL. And you're going to have to pass this drug and alcohol test. Now, I've written a few more details about that over here. Basically, the alcohol test is going to be two types. One is you need to pass a, a blood alcohol test like the police do on you. Okay. And the other is an ETG test. And what that is, is they're testing your urine um, for alcohol in the bladder. Now, a doctor will probably tell me that I'm wrong on this, but the, the fundamental bit you need to know is that that has a bit of a three to four day clearance. And so you don't want to drink basically inside three to four days and preferably inside a week before you think you're going to get screened because you just, you know, you don't want a positive result uh, going on your record and ruining your reputation with that airline forever. Um, I'm sure once you fail a test, that's it. They're just not going to look at you. So, you know, err on the side of caution. They say three to four days for that ETG test. Um, I would say, you know, seven days. And that's going to be very excessive, but just do it. Now, the other thing is this, check your prescriptions. Make sure your prescriptions are not going to show up in any of the toxicology drug tests that they're going to do. Ask your doctor about that. Tell them that you are going to be subject to uh, pre, you know, medical pre-screening from your employer for drugs and make sure you're not on anything that's going to show up in there or, or, or cause you to have a false positive. Now, another thing is some employers are going to do a hair test for drugs. Now, that... I'm not an expert on this, so I mainly want to raise it for your awareness. But that um, they say that they have a 90-day, uh, they'll show up positive for 90 days. Um, now, I'm not sure whether they measure a certain length of hair or what they do there. But again, have a, a very big margin of safety. And that just, a lot of you are going to go, oh, that's all right, I don't use drugs, right? But it's more than that, right? You've got to be careful that you don't expose yourself to something that could cause you to have a positive even though you don't use drugs. So for example, you know, going to a party where there is drugs, okay, or walking through an area where people are smoking uh, joints and you inhale the THC and stuff. I'm just encouraging you, I don't want you to be paranoid, but just be cautious that if you've got these employment screening tests coming up, that you're a little bit vigilant about uh, being exposed to drugs in any form. And if you have been exposed to drugs, you know, accidentally, you know, you walk through as some guy walking along the street was, you know, smoking a joint and he blew it in your face or whatever, then don't don't expose yourself to an intake where you'll be required to do the drug test. Maybe it means you've got to wait a few months and go into the next intake. Okay, just be cautious and be aware and be vigilant with that. And again, then you're going to need to sit your class one medical again around that 
um, because your, your class one will be expiring towards the end of your training. Now, the multi-engine uh, rating and the instrument rating. They could go here at the end of your uh, your employment where you're building your 550 hours. And now, this employment is likely to be, you know, parachute planes, um, also going up to remote areas and flying um, indigenous people around from the uh, remote areas or politicians around to the remote areas. Uh, it might be flying for cattle stations, etc. But you're probably going to get exposed to the drug testing there. And you might require your multi-engine or your instrument rating for that, okay? But if you don't, then what you want to do is you want to consider, should I be doing this at the start of my employment or at the end? Because will they want a fresh instrument rating? Will things have changed? And if I go into employment where I'm not using these, will I be non-current and then I'm going to have to pay to renew them? So that's just a consideration um, about, you know, a consideration on... On when you do that. Now, the only thing you've got to be aware of, though, is the hours that Qantas require. I've stipulated in there. They want multi-engine and they want instrument. So you're probably going to have to bring that forward into there somewhere, probably around the halfway point at a minimum, anyway. Um, but I'll leave that up to you to decide. Now, here's the thing: your additional 550 hours. If you're going to do that in 12 months, you're going to have to do. You're going to have to find a position that's got at least 11. Point five hours per week flying hours okay if you're going to do it in 10 months you need something that's got 14 hours per week flying hours if you're going to do it in eight months 17.2 if you're going to try and achieve it in six months it's 21.2 now the reason i raise all these timelines for you is because if you have a look at the intake programs for most of the major airlines and that they're a bit all over the place but they have times of the year when they do most of their recruitment okay so they'll open up a lot of their recruitment at the end of a year ready for the start of the next year because they're doing all their scheduling, they're doing all their intake. Um, if they want you to enrol in certain uh, classes or courses, often they'll start at the end of the year, etc. So if you happen to know that an airline does all of their intake, say in uh, December, then you can use these numbers to try and make sure that you're going to be ready for the intake. And if you're sitting in a job that's only got you flying, say 11.5 hours per week, but you're, you need 17.2 hours per week, then it's pretty clear to you that you need to start applying for jobs with someone who's got a few more flying hours, okay, rather than stay in the one you're in, or you might be looking at the next intake a whole another 12 months later. So work backwards from this point, from the intake point. When is the main intake point? How am I going to get there? Okay, I need, um, it's eight months away. I want to make sure I'm there. I need, so I'm going to do it in six months and I need to find a job where I need 21.2 hours flying per week. Okay, and then you can work backwards here too. You know, if, if you work back and go, okay, I want to be ready in December two years, you might work out that this, you can't afford to spend that long doing all your CPL exams. You might work out that the only way you can get there in time is to do it that way or, or perhaps that way. Okay, you might work out as you're working backwards that um, just need to shift this over so you can see that your CPL you can't afford to waste three months. You need to do it in two months, and that you need to do that in two months as well. Every person's going to be different. Every person's going to have different priorities, but that's how you do it. You don't start over here and go, oh, okay, I want to do it in two months, right? What you do is you you look at when the intakes are over here, and you work backwards. Okay, and you work out right. Okay, um, you know how many uh, how many hours do I need to do there? Uh, how how long do we need to compress that? Because we're in say December, say we're in uh, June now, and you want to be qualified in eighteen months. Well, clearly a twenty what have I got here? A twenty six month strategy is not going to work for you. You need to compress that by ten months. So you need to chop off ten months somewhere. So maybe you chop off uh, six months there. And maybe a chop off four months in your CPL exams. Or maybe a chop off four months there. Maybe a chop off a couple of months in your CPL exams. And maybe a chop off a month in RPL and a month in PPL. You see what I mean? So work backwards. So I hope that's helped, guys. I know this is a long video, but it's really going to help um, some people. So if it does, drop me a like, a share, a comment. Let me know that this helps. And uh, thanks for watching.